He would not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely, also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now, of course, I would point out, as we have, and we've dealt with this many, many times before, um, that's not where the passage starts. This is after the golden chain of redemption. This is after a discussion of predestination election. This is after some of the strongest assertions of the sovereignty of God and salvation in all of the New Testament. These are the next words. But here is Dr. Allen's treatment. This passage states several truths concerning the atonement. First, as the subject who delivered him, that is Christ, up, God is the one who initiated the atonement. Second, Paul says that Christ was delivered up, Greek paretikon, terminology that is sacrificial in nature. It's true. Third, Christ was offered up for us all. In this context, Paul is addressing believers and their current status as having been justified because they have believed in Christ. The focus is on the status of believers who are now in relationship with Christ via justification. I'm going to come back. I just want you to hear it all first. But I'm going to come back. But just please note what was just said there and what I said earlier about the last time faith was mentioned, what the immediate preceding context was, which is not about believers. It's about what God does. This is, this is what synergism does. You can be in the middle of one of the most important texts about what God does to glorify himself. And what does the synergist do? It's all about man. It's all about man. Anyway, some have attempted to use this text to support limited atonement. The argument is as follows. The all for whom Christ died, according to this passage, are given all things. The non-elect are not given all things, therefore Christ did not die for them. This is a modus tollens argument as distinguished from a modus ponens argument with an a fortoriori greater to the lesser layer as well. One, if Christ died for you, the greater thing, you will be given all things, including all consequent gifts, the lesser things. Two, some, i.e. the non-elect, are not given the lesser things. Three, therefore Christ did not die for some, the non-elect. If P, you are died for, the greater thing, then Q, all things are given the lesser things. Not Q, some are not given all things, therefore not P. The argument has a valid modus tollens form, but it is an unsound argument. Then he lays it out. All the died for receive all things. Some do not receive all things. Therefore, they are not died for. Here is the fallacy. The us in delivered him up for us all, Romans 8.32, is being converted into all for whom Christ died when contextually, now listen, contextually, the us refers to believers, not all for whom Christ died. This line of reasoning fails to recognize that Paul is addressing believers and describing their status as believers in relation to God's blessings. It confuses what Paul says to believers and about believers and extrapolates it into an abstract concerning all the elect, whether believing or unbelieving. But this merely begs the question concerning the extent of the atonement. The all in this passage refers to all believers as context makes clear. Though the word never appears in it. Context makes clear. To conclude from Romans 8.32 that Christ died only for believers and not for anyone else is to invoke the negative inference fallacy. Paul's not speaking about the elect qua elect, considered as an abstract class, the as yet unborn elect and the living but unbelieving elect. Paul's point is that no condemnation accrues to believers for whom Christ died, the greatest gift, and that they will be given all things, the lesser gifts, not that Christ did not die for all unbelievers. 
That's it. That's it. Now, no positive effort is made to exegete the text. Not even, not, not even the, the start. There's, there is no effort made. The whole thing is to try to provide a reason in light of these words not to believe what they say. Because, look, we've, we've walked through this before, but let's just, just briefly, I'll, I, will be, I will be short. I, I won't spend a lot of time on it. I'm going to put this back. So it, We'll spend a lot of time on it. We've already done this. But let's just remind ourselves. The context here began back in verse 28. That, and who is the actor? God. We know that God causes all things to work together for the good. For those who are the called, those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. So you have the called, you have God causing all things to work together for the good. You have, you have the specific use of the term clay choice. I just, I did a study Sunday evening at Apologia. Uh, I went through all the uses of called and chosen in the entire New Testament in one sermon. Yeah, I know. It was really exciting. Um, but we're in Matthew 24, and the section about, but for the sake of the elect, those days would be shortened. So Jeff asked me, it was, uh, had been scheduled a few months ago, you know, it's right after ReformCon, would you have the Sunday service? And he said, would you be willing to address that issue? So I thought, you know, I just want to make sure that our people have, have seen the whole, all the evidence. So let's just look at all the references. And people really liked it. They, they like doing it that way. It's an unusual way of doing things. That's not normally how I would do it. Anyways, there's the term, those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, not the firstborn amongst all of the universe, but firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. So you have the golden chain. You have the clear, you have God's predestination. Results in calling. This is effectual calling. Why? Because all those whom are called are justified. So there is a, there is a general call, which we are involved in giving, because we don't know who the elect are. But this calling is what God does. Just as God actively predestines, God actively calls. Those whom he actively calls, he actively justifies. Now, please note something. The same apostle who wrote this had written all the chapters beforehand, which had specifically said, you're justified by faith. But the word faith doesn't appear here. Why doesn't it appear here? Because that is the means by which we are justified. By God's grace, through faith alone. But our faith does not determine what God can and cannot do. Our faith is the result of his predestination, his calling. Those whom he calls, he draws to himself. Regeneration gives the gifts of repentance and faith. Repentance and faith are central. They're vital, but they're the result of what God does. What this text is about is the exact opposite of what Dr. Allen said right here. Because Dr. Allen has to turn this into God's talk. What's, what's being discussed here, what Paul's discussing here, is about believers. No, what Paul is discussing here is about what God, the triune God, has done. That's what's right there. So, called, justified, all who are justified by faith, that means if you're called by God, you're going to believe. This is in perfect harmony with Romans 9, John 6, Ephesians 1, where these things are addressed. Called, justified, all those who are justified, these he also glorified. Now, if you want to object to the idea of viewing the elect as a whole, then you need to object here. Because that's clearly what's being discussed here. Right? Are, are these words relevant to us or not? Are they only relevant to the, to the people who had already died in, in Paul's day? No. These are general statements, just as in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 2. 
You've died. Your life is hidden with Christ. God. Ephesians 2, you've already been seated in the heavenly places. Well, yeah, in the, in, as a divine general truth that then's worked out in time, right? Well, we all recognize that. So why object to it when we get to it later on? Well, many, many inconsistencies. Um, so that is the context. But isn't it interesting that the introductory line of the paragraph isn't quoted by Dr. Allen? What then shall we say to these things if God is for us, who is against us? Who's the us? I mean, the us is, is determinative here, isn't it? And given that this is the first line after what God does in saving a particular people whom he has predestined, who are called the Kletois, the, 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 the chosen ones, the called ones, back in verse 28, we're talking about God's elect, and that's exactly what he's going to say in verse 33. So there is a consistency here that is introduced by the author himself. We are not, we are not importing this. This is, we, we are following the exact same hermeneutics that we would use in defending the deity of Christ or the Trinity or the resurrection or any of these other central defining doctrines using the exact same hermeneutics. So, if God is for us, who is the us? Who can be against us? And then to answer that question is what verses 32 and following are about. Why can no one be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. Now, who's the us? Dr. Allen, his synergistic system, says that the us is determined by the human action of faith. The word faith does not appear in Romans chapter 8. It hasn't appeared for three chapters. What does appear is God's sovereign act of predestination that defines a particular people. And there has been a golden chain of redemption that has said predestination, calling, justification, glorification, who can be against us? That's the context. There is no concern for context here. The only concern here is we have to make sure that Southern Baptists don't believe in particular redemption. That's the ultimate drive of what's in these pages. Not what's in the text of Scripture. I read it to you, right? We're going to look at it again. So, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Now, I've never made the argument that is presented in these pages. The argument is not that, well, the died for greater thing, lesser things. The argument is who is the us and what does the death of Christ accomplish? That's what it's about. So by introducing all this extraneous philosophical look at how I can throw around terms of, from logic uh, stuff, you're distracting from the reality of what the text is actually saying. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, and he was right, this is sacrificial language, but delivered him over for us all. Exactly. So here, this is sacrificial language. Paretokin is exactly in the middle of God gave his son. He gave him son. He gave him what? Who pair Hamon for us. So exegetically, as we're following this through, who's the us? Don't distract us with modus. Ponens and Modus Tolens arguments, because that's not the argument. Ours is a much simpler, straightforward argument. The us 
are those who are the elect that God predestined. And you know, Dr. Allen, you know that this is as close to a direct statement of particular redemption as could possibly be written. And that's why you're distracting it. That's why you're going someplace else. You're going, hey, look over here. That's why you're doing it. I'm sorry you've been given this task. I think it happened somewhere around 2007, 2008. You've been given this task, and you've been faithfully pursuing it. Um, but not in a proper way. But delivered, but, and, and as you know, Dr. Allen, al huper hemon. So the first is, but in our behalf, ponton paradokin auton. So the emphasis is on the substitutionary aspect of what's found in the words. But delivered him over for us all. That's where the emphasis is found. And why is there an emphasis there? Because what's the question? The question is, if God is for us, who is against us? So you need to explain who, why this us has God on their side, and it's impossible for even the enemy himself to, to bring about their destruction. Why? Because the Son has been given over by the Father in their behalf. You see, in your view, that would not answer the question. Because, in your view, the Son was given over for all sorts of people that the enemy will destroy for eternity. Well, he doesn't do it. He brings about their destruction. He's a means used. But from your perspective, the Son has been given over for many for whom condemnation will come. That's your view. That every single person who will receive condemnation will be able to say, the Son was delivered over for me. That's your perspective. It's not a biblical perspective. It may be very common. But that's not what Paul is saying here. So, gave him over substitutionarily for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? With him. That's not some lesser thing. That's all wrapped up in him. The whole point that is not even acknowledged here, not even touched on, is the actual argument of particular redemption, and that is right there, he delivered him over for us all. Everything is found in him, and it's for a specific pur person, purpose. How will he not also with him freely, what? Give us all things. It's the same us. You see, Dr. Allen doesn't want to have to deal with the fact that he has to play with all sorts of different us's. And us here, and an us there, and us here, and us, and, and they're all defined based on synergistic categories. When a straightforward reading is very easy to understand. Very easy to understand. So, here's the question. We've had two questions. Verse 31 is a question. Verse 32 is a question. Verse 33 begins the question. Who will bring a charge against God's elect. How can you pretend to deal with Romans 8, 32-33 in regards to the subject of atonement and not deal with the fact that smack dab in the middle of it is the direct statement that this is about God's elect? And as, we're, as if you remember, I'm going to go back, but if you remember... He tries to shift the context and saying, this isn't about God's like. This is about God acting. No, this is, this is about the status of justified believers, even though he hasn't mentioned that for three chapters now. That's what it's about. And people didn't notice this when they read this book. Um, who will bring a charge 
against God's elect. God is the one justifying. Same term used in the golden chain. Who is justified? Those who were called. Who was called? Those who were predestined. So, there's, there's only a couple dozen words between here and there. Has something changed? No. So, God is the one justifying. Based upon what? In context, his calling. But, 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 but Romans 3, Romans 4, we're justified by faith. Exactly. So what is the calling of God going to inevitably result in in the lives of those thus chosen and predestined and called? Faith and repentance. That's why they're called gifts. That's why Paul can just easily flip past saying, Philippians 1.29, it has been granted to you not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for his sake. Oh, granted to me to believe. Yes, it has to be granted to you. See, it's just part of Paul's thinking. It's just, it flows. So who shall bring a charge against God's elect? God's the one justifying. Who is the one condemning? Christ Jesus, the one who died, Rather, the one raised, who is seated at the right hand of God, and who is interceding for us? Once again, if you're going to attempt to deal with the Reformed exegesis of this text, and you don't even mention our central argument, you don't even mention the connection, once again, of intercession with atonement. Here you have the Son. He's at the right hand of the Father, right hand of God, and he is interce interceding what? Huper hemon, the exact same words from verse 32. Our behalf, there is beautiful consistency. You cannot tear it apart. You cannot break it up. It's right there in front of you. So the argument is not a modus tollens, modus ponens with an a fortiori sublevel. It's much more straightforward than that. It's the text says God predestines, they're the elect of God, Christ dies for them, and because he dies and intercedes for them, no one can bring a charge against them. That's the argument. And until you respond to that argument, you haven't even touched the issue. After 1,100 pages of verbiage, 